London, the world's absolute epicenter of all things financial, and nowadays the absolute epicenter of every segment of technology that powers the global capital markets business, from tier one banks to the avant garde startups that are leading the way forward. Thought leaders from across the world, from hedge fund managers to developers of institutional algorithms that connect derivatives exchanges, and from portfolio managers using new age data and AI solutions, to heads of bespoke platform innovators, gathered at an invitation-only conference at one of London's most prestigious venues to foment the way forward for the electronic trading industry worldwide. Interactive debate on important subjects and vital networking giving access to highly experienced professionals from wide and varied sectors, gave thought leadership a new direction as we begin the journey towards the future of our highly advanced business. I'd like to introduce them one by one. We're going to have a very interactive debate about how we see the industry uh, having to move itself forward at these challenging times. So I'd like to join me, uh, it's Bradley Rotter. <coughs> Hi Bradley, Thank you. nice to see you. And uh, and uh, Strand Lloyd from CME Group in Singapore. <laughs> and also uh, Nathaniel, oh, uh, Alberto Piano, who is a professional trader on the listed derivative side of the business. And also Dr. Richard Smith. So, uh, this is a very interactive discussion ahead. There is, this is a, probably the first time in the industry where there has been absolutely no financial uh, incentive to anybody to be on a panel. This is purely a thought leadership where nobody's been, nobody has paid to be on a panel. So we're going to actually discuss and get out there what needs to be got out there. So the subject really is how do we now bring the level of the retail customer up to the institutional side and what do we need to develop in order to be able to do it? So. Uh, Let's begin. So Bradley, actually coming from, the, from, from, uh, from Silicon Valley and from various technology, technological developments in Silicon Valley, having developed quantum computers for uh, the government in the United States, has actually had a massive hand in starting this. So uh, feel free to be opinionated, Bradley. And trading commodities. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so it might be helpful if we all kind of gave our background just to give some context mm -hmm. to, the, to the group. Uh, my name is Bradley Rotter. I come from the colonies. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, yeah. Didn't, I didn't start trading commodities until I was 16. I grew up on a farm in Iowa. Mm -hmm. We actually raised corn and cattle. And uh, I, began, uh, I began trading commodities after, <laughs> after West Point. I raced back to Chicago to go to the University of Chicago. But that's where commodities were traded. So I traded on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the Chicago Board of Trade, the Chicago Mid-America Exchange, and this was, this was some time ago, but there were actually grown men yelling, kicking, screaming, shoving, and spitting. It was fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, was, I helped pioneer financial futures in the early days. That was futures contracts on things such as foreign currency, treasury bonds, treasury bills, Highly controversial at the time. Nobody thought it would work. The uh, the entrenched uh, interests of the, the mercantile exchange and the board of trade thought that that uh, cattle contracts and soybean contracts were quite enough. Uh, I thought futures contracts on the the largest commodity of all money was a really good idea. It turned out to be dominant in the, in, the, in the futures world, in the derivatives world. Uh, and then I began investing in another new asset class called hedge funds starting in 1982 and began seeding hedge funds in 1985 with venture capital. So I've been, uh, I've been in, in the world of alternatives for, for a very, my entire career. Uh, that, had, that led me into uh, another new asset class that's that's the most interesting one of all, which is digital currency and Bitcoin. I've been heavily involved in that for seven years, and that has led me into quantum computing, which we can get into later. But that's uh, that's the next important paradigm, I think, in, in the development of not just financial markets, but our lives in general. Thank you. So, uh, my name is Stuart Lloyd. Um, I work for the CME based in Singapore. 
Uh, apologies for the accent. I'm originally from South Africa. I've been out of the country for 22 years. So spent 14 years in London working for various banks, Citigroup, HSBC, um, and then moved across to Singapore with Credit Suisse. Um, in 2012, I joined the DTCC, uh, which is the probably the, what is the biggest uh, global trade repository. So really set up their business um, around the OTC derivative reporting uh, for APAC. Um, I moved on to the CME two years ago, again running the, it's not the most exciting thing, but it's running their global trade repository. Um, so what that really entails is, is ASIC reporting in Australia, uh, soon to be MAS in Singapore, and then obviously helping our APAC clients with their uh, regulatory requirements in Europe for ESMA, uh, MIFID II reporting, as well as uh, the US for the CFTC, Canada, um, as well as SFTR, which is coming up pretty, pretty soon. So, yeah, it's it's um, it, it definitely is something the retail uh, client is is certainly a large segment of our market, uh, specifically in Australia. Um, I would say seventy percent of our market is is with the retail clients. I think um, it's key, you know, that you know the way we onboard clients in the retail space. Uh, the new products that are being traded, uh, firms are aware of what requirements are, are there from a regulatory perspective, because it does add significant costs to the way that you're doing business. So that's it for me. Um, my name is Alberto Piano. Uh, so I'll give you some background. I started when I was very young, I was 17 as a stockbroker. I remember the, in Italy, because I'm Italian, the stock exchange was very physical. And I remember that uh, uh, there were physical contact with the other brokers. Everyone was shouting, but everything was very easy. Just buy the share, keep for a couple of days, and you make some money. And you remember me, the, the story, with the first uh, money that uh, I had, I bought some shares, and I said, oh, it was very easy. Just keep for a couple of days. I'm a trader. So after two, three days, I remember I was losing 5%. Okay, easy. I'm a trader. So I doubled my position. It's easy. Everything is going up. So after two weeks from a trader, I became an investor. And after three months from an investor, I became a guy that still has the shares on the wall. Because I still have these shares. I lost everything. So I understood that I think everyone has this experience from a share that he bought starting as a trader, a short-term investment, short-term deal, and became an investor, and then uh, didn't manage correctly the risk. So now, I'm, I consider myself a trader, and I'm an educator, and as an educator, I see that the information now is uh, the key. Many years ago, information wasn't so easy for everyone. Uh, the cost? And now the information is very, very easy to have for everyone, for retail, for a professional. But I see that in education, we have to increase the level of education. It's not simple to explain clients a setup, an entry point. It's everything about money and risk management. This is the key point. Information, money, risk management, and the attitude, the behavior. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Smith um, introduced this important point, the behavior, the passion, how to be in the market, be, have the right attitude while you are waiting for the next trade, for the trade. So we are not talk talking about mathematical formulas, difficult mathematical, uh, academical formula. Everything is easy because the market is easy. I always start my educational courses with a question. Do you know what the market is? And I always have different answer. But the, what's the market? The market is just an expectation. It's the sum of expectation of every participant. <clears throat> Very easy. And also, it's another important point. It's what uh, we call the third force. Third force, it's the the people, that investors that are waiting to enter in the market with their investment. So we are not talking about 
PhD, something <laughs> difficult, you know? We use mathematical formula for, to help investors, to help traders. But remember that now it's the behavior. It's your, how you approach the market that is the most important thing. But uh, at the beginning, at the very beginning of the career, you go and look for setup. You go look for someone that could make you become rich in two days. The approach is short term. But also I agree with you that uh, now the new, let's say my daughter, uh, the young people, they have information, they want something, they have a different approach to the market. And we can teach them how to have this different and better <coughs> approach to the market. To manage the risk, to have a long view, not just become a speculator, be a speculator, but an investor. This is completely different. And I think a lot of the younger people, especially we were, we've had this discussion before, are looking to go down the route of you probably all the all the sharing applications that we see now from things like shared scooters or Airbnb or all of this. This is now established. So a lot of the younger traders who will come on board now are going to look for app-based solutions which connect them to multi-asset brokerages and are broker agnostic and other things like that. And I think that is really where some kind of algorithmic API based connectivity has to connect to a single source where the platform is is proprietary and owned by the actual provider and behind it is a series of different brokers and series of asset classes. I think that's probably what do you guys think about that? Uh, that's certainly something I've been successful with in my business. You know, we connect to over 20 different online brokers. Uh, one of the things that people value about it is that it's one place that they can track all their portfolios. And again, um, I'm, I'm not sure this is true, but I, I heard this uh, a story about um, a chemist at uh, 3M, you know, the uh, chemical corporation who invented a weaker glue, right? And uh, went to his bosses, hey, I invented a weaker glue. And they were like, what the heck are we going to do with a weaker glue, you know? Why, why would you do that, you idiot? And, um, <laughs> but it uh, turned out to be post-it notes, right? And it was a whole um, new business line that developed around a weaker glue. And that just connects back to my belief that people are kind of overwhelmed by information. Yes, information is uh, so incredibly accessible, but I think people have kind of gotten beyond the point of just wanting more information and again, they want to know what to actually do with that information, how to make decisions, how to integrate it into their lives. You know, and, and I think with young people, there's really a danger that if we don't educate them about capital markets, they're very skeptical about capital markets. You know, they're down on capitalism. And also, very I educated. think it's a big problem. Very they're very educated. Very you know, they're, we're not going to pull the wool over these it's guys. Not <laughs> it's not possible anymore to go to a client base with a lead marketing system and try and onboard people onto a white label MT4 and then do a CPA based. It's just not possible because everybody knows that that is an affiliate marketing CPA. It's not. And if they don't know, they're going to ask their friends, and one of their friends is going to know correct. and tell them, you know, stay and away from that. Now you have a whole range of people, especially here in London, who are working in the app development and tech development fintech sector, and they know exactly how it all works. So the, yeah. the level of the regulated good quality brokers in places like uh, Scandinavia, Britain, North America, Australia and so forth are able to onboard the better quality of customers. For example, you guys have probably seen this. Here in London there's a Mexican restaurant chain called Chilango and they've got, they're offering bonds. They are offering bonds. So it's a really good uh, client base because you have people like us who will go there for their lunch and they'll see 8% for a bond. That's a really good client base. So all of those particular uh, potential customers are not going to go to a offshore island-based lead marketing style white label because they know that, that their, uh, their own um, account isn't going to be handled by that broker. It's going to be handled by either a pseudo liquidity provider that owns that broker, or, which isn't really a liquidity provider, or it's going to be simply going in the bucket and they're going to take their deposit. These guys know that. So, you know... That's something where we have to move ourselves on, I would say. Yeah, I, I can comment. So on, on, the, on the post trade side, this is you know, more on the, on the reporting. In terms of, I think where the challenge for retail firms is, is, is the kind of um, 
the numerous systems they do have with information and how they bundle that together as one. You know, if you look at, you talk of MT4 in the FX space, there's very little data that they can actually, you know, the regulator actually requires 50, 60 fields per transaction. So, you know, you, you've got to have, you've got Tom here from, say, Goldar, for example, they're bridge providers. Um, there's numerous bridge providers, but basically aggregators of data and finding gold and source is now becoming a paramount. Um, finds, a, finds a massive for the regular reporter. But that's more on the post trade side. I think that's right. I think choosing how your system, exactly, Tom would relate to this exactly good example, that how your platform integrates with the capital markets is vital. That's a really important linchpin for the future, practically, right? It is. But I want to take issue with something Richard said. I All right. <laughs> I think the uh, the young generation is has been trading digital assets since they were young boys and girls, and that's bec that's because of the, of the digital of of, of gaming. Uh, this dawned on me one one night in San Francisco. I got up at three thirty in the morning to go to the restroom, and I saw a glow coming under my son's door. I marched into the door. He was there at his computer playing World of Warcraft at 3.30 in the morning. And as, and as I dug further about what was going on, he had 10 people working for him in this game, gathering gold and swords that he needed to make some portfolio swap for a new piece of armor. This was at 3.30 in the morning. When I learned that fact, I said, carry on. <laughs> these, these young people now, with, with regard to Bitcoin and digital currency, are unbelievably sophisticated in terms of hedging, options, trailing stops. It's phenomenal. There's a new world beginning, and they're much more attuned to, uh, to these new markets than you could possibly believe. We, we, we started from the lack of information many years ago to main information. So now it's important how to read all this information. Because I remember when I was young, it was difficult to <laughs> have information. Now I see it, my, my, my workers, they are young, so they work at 2 o'clock in the morning with all these arcades. But they have two main information. It's, uh, we have to teach them how to read, how to select, how to filter all, all this information. This is very important. Because two nothing and too much so we have to deal we have to to find the equilibrium on between these two and how do you do that software software so we have many software that are, we are developing kind of software that uh, trading uh, speaking is tracking uh, traders uh, trades so we pull up data from a database historical and real time data so we give a feedback to the traders. For example, you are positive on during this time of the day. You usually are not good on Wednesday because <laughs> why? Because they have macro data release, for example, in crude oil, for example, or the first Friday of every month because uh, unemployment rate uh, data is coming out. So it's kind of filter that could help you to become be a better trader. So this software is going to help you, giving you some metrics in real time and also past, past trade, to filter and to be also in real time to give you some alerts. Give you a, an example. Uh, some metrics could uh, tell you that if a winning trade, you keep a winning trade for 10 minutes, for example, and you usually keep a losing trade for three hours, okay? So now you are in a trade, and you, your trade is after 35, 40 minutes, you are still in the trade, and you are losing some money. Maybe it's better to cut this trade, not to wait for two hours, you know? Why? So this metric is going to help you to stay on track, to stay, stick to your plan, because you have to plan your trade always. So this kind of software could help you to read, better read the market, better read also your behavior, your, your trading style. Yep. I think it's actually, that's a good point. I think it's time 
really, and this is very, very uh, controversial point at the okay. moment, but I think it's time that traders at work were starting to get into the point where they are actually paying subscriptions for those types of external services without them being integrated into a retail platform. That eliminates the lead sourcing and CPA aspect of trying to gain commission deals between broker, retail brokers and educational providers and gives it more. And, and an actual uh, retail broker who's of good standing and understands how to trade properly should be paying a subscription for a good quality external service like that, which keeps it completely agnostic and it works for him. Because if you don't have three or four hundred dollars a month to pay for external services and software that helps you trade, then you shouldn't really be trading, actually, in my opinion. Yeah, just I mean, a, a good point there is, is we get asked a lot, what, what are the regulators doing with the information that the trade repository is giving them? And the honest fact is that they actually don't have a clue. Right. Um, they've asked for the kind of reams of data, they're getting in millions of trades a day. But if there was another financial crisis, could they actually pin that down and say it was down to this factor? Or, and they couldn't. I mean, they're looking at really high level. There's 20 retail firms reporting in Australia. Why it's firm A reporting differently to the other 19? That's the kind of level that they're looking at. So if you look at the cost to the industry or the regulatory reporting, it's, it's enormous. It is. Um, and as you say, too much data. Despite all of the recent moves towards electronifying, it's still relatively inefficient at the actual regulatory. Absolutely. Can I ask a question, Andrew, just on this on, on the panel? You sort of be interactive. So. Um, I was interested on the what you were saying about um, a service where traders would see how long they had a position for if they were holding it for too long, etc. I mean, we have a product like that, but we've never looked at selling it to end traders, we sell it to brokers. And I was interested in whether you think there's a market there, and if there is, how much you think traders would pay to see whether it's a viable product. I think that is more an added value that a broker has to give to clients. Um, because you being a broker is not just holding your your, your order past the market. It's just to give you, to teach you how to use the information and to give you some added value. And this is an added value that the broker has to offer you. It's uh, a newsletter, and this software, other services, of course. But this must come from a broker to a client. <laughs> and I think this is a key point for all the brokers that they want to stay in the market and increase <coughs> the educational level of <coughs> their clients because they have to raise this quality of information, quality of education. And you think they should, it should be provided by a broker but then charged as a flat fee, like a software licensing fee? I think that uh, Schwab recently instituted a uh, monthly subscription yeah. service for financial planning and they, I was just reading about it. They charge a $300 upfront fee yeah. and then uh, $30 a month subscription for basically. unlimited access to tools and financial planners. Um, on a subscription-based service, which is, you know, uh, a great model for the retail investors now. They make money in other ways on the model as well. But I think that's definitely where it's going. And you asked the question earlier, Andrew, about how do we help retail investors kind of get up to a higher institutional level. <clears throat> I think you're exactly right that, you know, these tools and services exist in the brokerage companies already for the professional investors, right? And I think that, you know, this is going to get out to the public. Right? Somebody's going to come along and bring these tools out to the public and present them in an easy to understand way. It's happening in, happening in other industries already. Um, I recently decided to try to uh, start running, right? And I used a little app called Couch to 5K, right? So get you off the couch to running a 5K in eight weeks, right? So beforehand, you know, you'd have to get a running coach or you'd have to start reading running magazine or, you'd, you know, you'd, but now this little app is just like, nope, week one, day one, do this. Week one, day two, do this. Week one, day three, do this. And that technology is going to get out to the retail investor. And I think one of the things that uh, we see in with companies, you know, all across the globe now is there's a huge advantage in being, you know, the first to market with something like that and there's a snowball effect where somebody who does succeed in really connecting with um, consumers in a more authentic, direct and effective way, you know, can really expect to reap the lion's shares of the rewards. So I, I've been reading a book called Play Bigger, which is a great business book if anybody uh, wants to check out a great book. And it's all about exactly how, you know, the Ubers, the, you know, Facebooks, 
you know, when you really get a market and you connect with people in a new way and you provide a new value, um, you know, you can really dominate the market. And I think that's what's happening, you know, across industries. And I think that's coming to finance. And I think anybody who doesn't, you know, start to really provide value to their uh, customers in a very authentic way, you know, is in dan big danger of getting disrupted That's and displaced. Absolutely right, and actually becoming obsolete. Becoming obsolete, obsolete absolutely. Because the thing is, that it's actually a good point about emulating other industry sectors, because there are a lot of ways that good quality industry sectors can be emulated on a technological basis and the user experience. Yeah. It's very, very good for that. And actually, we spoke, Bradley and I spoke about recently, how the very top-end quantum computing can be used in this particular sector for exactly that purpose, for exactly as, as Richard explained, for exactly that purpose. And that could well be the future of trading. You know, I want to make a, a broader thought, though, as I, I, I've been thinking about this the last few days after, after being with the Scandinavian guys. I think this is the golden age for retail investors. It certainly is. And it's, and it's basically because of, of one development, the internet. When I found the internet in uh, when I found the internet in San Francisco, I was walking down the Embarcadero for past the Hyatt Regency, and saw a hand scrawled sign scotch taped to the window of the Hyatt, and it said, "Internet Conference Second Floor." I go, "Wonder what that is." <laughs> I walked up to the second floor. There were three booths, seven people, and I bought my domain name, Rotter.com. And and from that very moment, I I was thinking, "What does this mean?" I think globally what it meant, and I, and I said this in speeches you know, back in 2000, wouldn't it be ironic if America's greatest gift to the planet was the linchpin of their demise? I think the internet will cause the peak of US civilization. We'll meet back here in 10 or 20 years and see if that's correct. But for retail investors, how about retail consumers? Are we better off? Much better. Has anybody been to a store lately? Yeah. It's so much more efficient. So the internet empowered something also very, very important to, to investors, and that is, as a longtime observer of trends, the strongest trend I have ever seen is the trend in commission rates. Why is it the strongest trend? Because it never upticked. It's down all the time. The, the amount of information flow available to all of us. If you're, if you're watching Twitter or, or Fox News, you have better information than, than many traders on a Wall Street desk who, who don't have time to be involved with, with Twitter feeds. Information, information is, a, is an important edge. As a, re, as a retail investor, as an institutional investor, you better have an edge or you shouldn't be making the trade. Uh, typically, information is an important edge. A system like Richard's or discipline is, is, is an important edge. But the information available to us now, yeah, it's a lot. But the, the information, depending on how you use it in a disciplined fashion, is a tremendous edge that, that we didn't have before. When I first started trading on Chicago Board of Trade in the bond pit, I, the bond pit was brand new. There were 30 guys in the pit, but I positioned myself in the bond pit where I could see a Dow Jones news tape in the other room, in the grain room. That was an edge, because at the time the Federal Reserve would raise the discount rate in the middle of the day. Where I was standing, I could see the Fed raise the discount rate and would start selling, and I literally had a five or 10 second edge because my, most of my competitors thought the Federal Reserve was an Indian reservation in Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> so those are, the, those are the kind of edges that, uh, and they're available now. They're harder to find because there's more participants. But find your edge and, uh, and it'll be valuable. I, I got a good in, uh, product idea for you too to apply my system to trading uh, World of Warcraft paraphernalia. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Bradley. <laughs> I think they actually. Um, this is looking at that from the other side. There's a lot of negativity about the 
infiltration of what is considered gaming into the lower end of the retail market. Mm -hmm. But it's actually not that kind of gaming or that kind of people that are doing it. It's basically the um, kind of internet-based advertising people that are using those leads to bring them to retail customers. The retail customer gets another white label and reach out to say leads. If you're looking at gaming in terms of strategic gaming like that, the younger generations who do a lot of that, I was a friend of mine's house yesterday, very religious people, they don't watch television, they don't anything like that, living in North London here, completely uh, in, inward looking community, their three sons are masters at these computer games, strategic computer games. So they're like concentrating on these mathematical, as a result, they're, they're teenagers and they're really up for, the, the, they're going to head in school a year and taking their mathematics qualifications a year early. So these are the future of people who are going to master these algorithmic systems of trading and become very, very good at, at that. So they need a good brokerage which goes to them on a personal basis and builds what they need and, uh, and then takes that to the liquidity provider and the technological uh, platform provider, which should be, in my opinion, broker agnostic and very... Uh, very user friendly and then connect to any broker and then use these types of strategies to actually gain information and act, and, uh, and actually act on it. And these the young generation like that are exactly the people who are capable of doing that. And I think this, this kind of legacy system that a lot of companies are in needs to go and God is trying to start investing in moving that forward now. <coughs> because they, they play and they invest with not motion. That's right. That's exactly And right. what is important for them is the quality of data. It's very, very important to have unfiltered and quality of data, a high level of, of, of data. Something that we didn't have in the past. Mm -hmm. Something that is very affordable for everyone. So this new generation, as they have the right minds, we are prepared for this. Mm -hmm. uh, retail clients, uh, now they started from a different level. They, they are information, they have more information, of course. And uh, I think that also as brokerage, you have to give them new services. It's not only a connection to anymore, something more. I mean, look at the device of social trading. Exactly. Gone. Gone. Completely mm -hmm. gone. Too much of a conflict of interest. And, and also, just uh, the, the question that the gentleman uh, uh, asked me, uh, I think it's important for, uh, for a client to have someone that is tracking your, your performance, your trade. I see that many, of, uh, many traders, they are looking for someone keeping tracking of, of what they are doing. <coughs> I, I see that they, they give importance to this. It's a, it's a value. They can pay for this value. If you're a broker and you are taking care not only of their trades, but you just make an email or a chat or something, but be in communication with them and say, okay, I'm tracking your trading, you are doing this, that, so <coughs> maybe you can change something, rebalance your portfolio, give some more information to help to become to be a better trader. <coughs> They decide, of course. They will keep all the decision, investment decision. But you, you are going to give them more information to to, to take better. Are oh, you at risk of them being giving advice and, okay. and treading on on, uh, on the wrong the wrong line of the regulatory? Curve, you know? Almost becoming private banking. Yeah. It's, you can automate so much of private banking, but you can <coughs> your personal touch in that relationship and. So no, actually, actually the FCA is no. right. Actually, the FCA is looking at making these external systems regular, uh, register themselves as a financial advisor. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so what they're trying—the reason for this is not to penalise companies providing those services and make them sub subservient to regulations. The reason for it, because let's be fair, the FCA has a regulator, has a, a fintech sandbox. They're trying to encourage this kind of uh, development, but. What they're doing, in my opinion, and I've not got them, they haven't spoken to me about this, but in my opinion, what it looks like to me is that they are trying to encourage the separation between remuneration agreements between broker and, serv and uh, signal provider and so forth. They've seen so many of these kinds of very generic signal providers which tie up with a broker and they, they're remunerated on volume. They're trying to break that chain and have a software licensing model 
and make those software companies <coughs> register as a separate, uh, the only way they can do it is via a separate style of regulation, which is a financial advisor. So therefore, you, about two years ago, they said they were going to encourage the licensing of external, so, external signal providers as, as financial advisors, and they're not allowed to take rebates. So it's going that way, and if it doesn't go that way, the FCA will make it so that you have to go that way. A lot of the software providers don't get <coughs> regulated because with regulation comes costs, comes rights, comes requirements. So I think that's it's, about, it's all about breaking the, breaking the model of, of volume. It should be, it, as, once they start going down the subscription based or software licensing model, like they do in institutional desks where they have to, Bloomberg, which nobody, let's, this is a nasty thing to say, but nobody respects them as an actual software <coughs> provider, charging £2,000 per month for the terminal. And nobody minds, because that's a subscription model. It's always been a subscription model. Banks and prop, prop desks and so forth need it because they need to be able to be in touch with each other. Everybody pays the licensing fee without even thinking about it. So I believe that the new generation of, of trader who pay subscriptions for pretty much everything else they use on that basis will accept that without even questioning it, in my opinion. I've explored this a lot, uh, paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to lawyers in the United States to explore this question of, you know, where is this line between financial advice and, uh, and subscriptions? I'm on the entirely non-regulated side. I provide strictly information, but I am doing it in a way that is, you know, more suggestive than most software providers about what actions people should take, right? Like I've got a red, yellow, green system Many people interpret my signals as green means buy and red means sell, right? Um, but it's amazing how little um, has been decided in this space about what the rules are, right? I went back into you know, the SEC archives to find the letters of, you know, that they had put out uh, about um, computerized decision making in the financial mm -hmm. markets. And they literally, like the most current letter I could find was in 1985. You know, I mean, literally like over 30 years ago. Um, and they're, they're working this out on a very active basis right now, but it's not clear. There's tremendous gray area. I think if you already are on the regulated side, it's more problematic, right? Mm -hmm. It's less problematic for me and probably a bigger advantage for me because I'm not on the regulated side right now. But I know TD Ameritrade in the United States, for example, you know, they had some signals and they stopped providing those signals of buy, sell because they were concerned about the regulators, you know, getting at their other business, right? So that's sort of another uh, interesting dynamic in the marketplace right now. Andrew, I if we can just make a comment. I think this is a really important point, actually, because uh, <clears throat> there's been a, a case in the US recently um, where a soft software uh, developer who developed the, the code that was used for, uh, I think, Nav Saro, uh, who uh, traded, uh, um, yes. and, you know, the whole case around the flash crash. The, yeah, yeah, exactly. So the, the, the software developer is now, um, the, there's a, a court case going on, he's being prosecuted for, because his software was used, supposedly, allegedly, um, to, you know, for, for, for some of the events that, that uh, um, were part of the, the, the flash crash. I think this is a really, you know, as, as machines and, and, you know, AI and machine learning and so on, becomes you know more kind of integrated in the market. I think it's 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 a really key point for people to be aware of. Is, is you know where where does that line lie? And, and, and that you know if you are developing software and if you are um, you know putting systems together um, to to be aware of how they're being used because you could be on the hook at some point in the future. You could I think it will go the way of it will have to be licensed as a financial advisor, this external system, mm -hmm. and it's subscription based, and it's going to retail customers of brokers. Mm -hmm. If it's a proprietary trader who's trading on his own account. I think they can build, they'll just be able to build, like this guy now, yep. they'll be able to build their own software or pay a subscription for a service, rather than like institutional traders do. And then it's not nice, because it's not advice, they're acting on their own, they're trading on their own account, they're not taking anything from brokerage, they're going straight to an LP or straight to a private provider, or if they've got a big account, straight to a bank. Uh, however, external prosecutions like that mm. are to do with disrupting exchanges and going against the terms of conditions of exchange. Anyone can be liable for that. I think the regulatory aspect is just to separate the conflict of interest between broker and provider and make it so that it's external, therefore you have a more democratized system. And quite a lot of, this is the thing, man. quite a lot of good quality technology providers in this industry 
have gone down the route of trying to democratise the trading system, trading system, and they should continue to do so. No. The next generation of traders may not be human. I like to say there's only going to be two kinds of people, those who design robots and those who work for robots. And so we as, we as investors have to, have to face the reality that, that uh, our competitor on the other side of the pit is, doesn't sleep, doesn't get divorced, doesn't get hung over, and, is, and is, willing to, is willing to be there 24 hours a day when we cannot. And so perhaps your edge as an individual trader is to design a robot that takes advantage of the other robots. That's an interesting idea to... Human error, is, the human error is the cause of a lot of these accidents, just like it is with the motor industry. Most people who know me and know that I'm a car enthusiast, and now we're seeing, the, I've been driving these autonomous cars, and they're incredible. They're fun, and even as a driving enthusiast, I'd rather sit in the highway with the car driving itself, because it's much safer than me doing it. So you have this same principle, unless you do what they did in KCG in, nine, in 2000. Yeah. 12, I believe it was. Yeah, the, the, the software developer connected a test algorithm to a production server, end of the company within five minutes. But as long as that is, but then again, what will happen is that will also not be a human either. And those servers look like a mobile phone now. They don't look like, this is, this five years is a long time ago in this industry and we're still doing the same software. We're still doing the same things five years later. I'm looking forward to autonomous cars. I find it very difficult to drive while I'm texting. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, I think you're right. I think it has to go down the autonomous route. But it's also lack of, those, those systems are often, are often dealt with. In the institutional world, a lot of um, aut automatic trading systems are developed by the trader themselves. Uh, in fact, Charles, who is here right now somewhere, yes, has been doing that for some time and had done a very good job of it. So um, this is the institutional side, but the retail sector will get, instead of doing it themselves, they will be able to buy in those external tools to actually connect it up. And I don't mean these EAs that are connected to MT4, I mean things that emulate that kind of system. So we've got to build the brokerage sector to be able to deal with those things and, and accommodate those types of traders and you get a better quality of client, in my opinion. So, Andrew, why haven't EAs worked then? Why, why they have, but they, what they've done is driven a specific sector of the industry. So it's, it's fueled the, um, the, the popularity of MetaTrader in the Asia-Pacific region in particular. It has also been part and parcel of the affiliate structure between IB introducing brokers and retail clients in certain regions because a lot of portfolio managers in, in those areas, some of them have, are doing 90,000 lots a month. They're huge and it's all automated, but they're doing it on a MetaTrader for MAM account, connecting the A's to it. It was a great business model for many, many years. However, China is a communist country and it was inevitable that in the end they would apply the same business rules to that as to any other business sector in the whole country where you're not allowed to import or export and the government has to own part of your business and you have to do it internally within China. So unless you're going to sell your company to Geely Corporation, which is what Saxo Bank did, and they don't even use MT4, they're using their own systems, you're going to have all of that business chopped off because you're relying on third party platform and a third party owner of your client base, which is MetaQuotes, once the regulations come up and the, the, the government, like in Australia, there's a lot of brokers there that had a lot of business there, 12, 13 MetaQuotes servers because they needed to service China. Once that goes away, they cannot move forward because all the infrastructure is generic and off the shelf and is owned by somebody else. So they can't sell their business, they can't IPO their business, they can't re re quickly replicate that business that's been going on before because it's all now going to go because they can't do it. If you've got your own, if you emulate the institutional sector, you are basically able to bring on board institutional level traders from all across the world in, in, in jurisdictions where you're not going to have that problem and with these terrible regulatory, and I don't approve of what, don't get me wrong, I don't approve of what the Australian regulator did recently which was to very quickly chop off all of the APAC business because there was no customer, com there was absolutely no reason whatsoever to do that other than pressure from other regulatory uh, jurisdictions. If something like that happens, which it does all the time in this day of electronic regulation, you're safe from these problems because many of your clients will be professional traders who are trading their own accounts and using 
subscription-based services to get signals and are pr pragmatic people. And even if they're portfolio managed, they will be more towards the, the institutional side rather than retail portfolio managers using MAM accounts. So in my opinion, the EA is a generic way. Doing things algorithmically and having subscription-based, properly designed uh, institutional grade software is a sustainable, modernizable way of attracting the right traders, in my opinion. There's also a point of, of regulatory you know, risk that you run. I mean, we've seen certainly a lot of flow and move off uh, from Europe into Australia. I think that's all right. seems to do with leveraging ratios. That's to do with you've got you know, two or three regulations here, yeah. ESMA as well as MIFID and potentially SFTR. So we've seen firms move to Australia. All Australia are going to do is follow what MBA do. That's, that's, that's what they, they've admitted to. So kind of, I suppose, where's the next country? And then it's continually moving the goalposts. It's not just the retail space. We see it with banks looking to change booking <coughs> locations, um, setting up legal entities in, in various jurisdictions, you know, to get away from the high burden of operating. Yes, firms. and unfortunately, and you've, I'm sure you've seen this as well, Strand, some of the ones that don't want to go down, go the hard yards and invest in these things, now cancel their licenses, not right. sure. And what are we doing by doing that? We're just making matters worse. So what? The brokerage business has to do is move itself forward to the to emulate the institutional rather than go back 10 years to the offshore stuff, which is really not worth doing at all. So uh, that concludes the panel, which I hope was pretty interesting. And uh, now we have the yeah, sure, by all means, absolutely. Because I was thinking about your question a little bit more about how much would people be willing to pay for that service, right? I think the question we need to be asking ourselves is how much are we willing to pay to build trust with a customer? And I think that I've found a lot that just by, oftentimes we provide these services to people that seem like really high value services, give them away for less, but ultimately they don't want to do it themselves, right? Like, but you build the relationship with the customer that they see that you're authentic, that you're providing real solutions, and then ultimately they build that trust with you and then they're like, hey, could you do this for me? You know, like I have 30,000 customers now, and I tell you, 20,000 of them would love for me to provide them an automated service to do this themselves now that they trust me and they trust my system and they believe that I'm really delivering value to them, right? So I think there's an interesting kind of lead acquisition strategy by delivering high value, um, you know, at a, at a marginal price as a loss leader to build the relationship and the trust. So the that is should there. go down in price. Because what we'll be doing Ultimately, is what the lifetime value will go up. That's right, lifetime value and the quality of the trader. So there's less, less hand-holding required and a much end, longer lifetime trust value. in that relationship is, that is the most valuable That's absolutely right. So you asset. Know, it's a big expense of clients, the acquisition. So by doing that, we'll be able to get that down and more, a more sustainable client but I just base. see people going after volumes you know, leads, and I think it's a, I think it's a crappy way to live. <laughs> Very good. Well, now we're going to adjourn for lunch, which is going to be in the drawing room just there on the right. And uh, during lunch and, and for the remainder of the afternoon is an afternoon of, of, of networking and basically uh, linking one high quality aspect of the industry with the other. So have a good afternoon. <laughs>